This is an example of play for Napoleonische Kriegsführung version 2 rules, which as per all my example of play videos will cover the first few game turns of a game, allowing players to determine if the rules are suitable for them and assisting those players in at least learning the rules to the point where they can begin a game without spending enormous amounts of time studying rules. Napoleonisch Kriegsführung version 2 is based on the Core Commander version 6 quick play game system, which in turn is based on the Core Commander version of rules which came out in 1986 and 1988 by Bruce Reed Taylor. Both versions of Core Commander are both designed for 20th century conflicts, so they may not be what you would expect to be suitable for Napoleonic warfare. However, this has occurred in the past, WRG Napoleonics being influenced by WRG World War II rules and Hoplite Research Group's Core Commander Napoleonic sets of rules influenced by their 20th century Panzer Corps sets of rules. Core Commander version 6 quick play game system has spawned a number of rules based on different scales, with Neu, a divisional commander, which uses a scale of one element equals a company, being the specific version used for Napoleonisch Kriegsführung. The version 2 indicates the use of the, the uses the game system which does not use strength point, which means all casualties are taken in whole elements. The primary driver of Core Commander version 6 being quick play rules while retaining sufficient flavour to avoid becoming a chess set-like set of rules. Any set of rules, or new set of rules, has to possess some unique attribute, otherwise players would be better off playing an existing set of rules. The unique aspect in these rules are the fact that it uses a big base concepts while retaining individual element movement and fire combat. Players who wish to play a set of rules which are purely element manoeuvre should consider DBN, or WRG, or a host of similar other rules. Players who wish to play a set of rules which are pure big base rules should consider Blucher, BBNB, or something similar. If you want a set of rules which merges the best aspect, or at least I hope the best aspect, of both these types of rule sets, then Napoleonischka Kriegsführung version 2 may be the set of rules that would interest you. The second unique aspect or attribute of these rules are its scale, with each figure representing 250 infantry, 200 cavalry or 16 guns. Thus a line infantry element represents 1000 men or approximately a probably field regiment. Cavalry elements represent between 400 to 600 horses each, depending of course how many figures are based on each element. Players would typically command from between 2 to 4 corps made up of two to four divisions each, each of which consist of three to four elements each. Scale has a significant impact on rules and play, with these scale being reasonably unique compared to other sets of rules. In order for any set of rules to be actually useful, you need extensive supporting material, and one of the most important aspects you need to provide are army lists or scenarios, and these sets of rules are no exception. Uh, the rules will actually pro be provided with extensive army lists based on actual battles or based on other sets of rules such as WRG Napoleonics converted to these sets of rules, whichever the player particularly prefers. This particular example game is based on army lists which are in turn based on the forces available to the Austrians and French at Marengo in 1800. The scenario is loosely based on the initial Austrian attack and victory against the French forces. The Austrians outnumbered the French by 2 to 1 for the first three game turns, with the French consisting of two corps. On game turn 4, a third corps arrives. The Austrians possess four corps. A quick note about Marengo. The Austrians did not use a corps system, with the C and C commanding the bulk of the Austrian army and with two smaller columns on each flank. This represents a major uh, command issue in the rules, and if you played a historical game using these rules, the Austrians would take forever to line up for their initial attack against the French, which actually historically uh, did take a long time, almost two hours. This does not even take into account the slow advance of the army out, out, out of the fort fortifications and across the river also caused by command issues. Now, I will make no attempt to duplicate in this example game, as that represents complexity which is not appropriate for an initial example game and also would take forever to actually achieve the initial attack. 
In the example game, the French have two cores, one on each flank, with a C and C in the center. Now, of course, historically, uh, the C and C was one of the core commanders. But once again, I'm not attempting to duplicate this exactly. This is just an example game. All elements have been allocated to each of the two core, and deployment is allowed anywhere on the playing area except the 20 centimeter closest to the enemy player edge. You'll notice the playing area is only two feet deep, or 60 centimeters. The whole playing area is three feet wide by two feet deep. The main objective of these rules is to allow games on a playing area of that size, so you can both be seated for the entire game. The Austrians will be arriving on the first game turn, obviously. The Austrians place their initial forces on the player edge, and then initiative is spun. This is game turn one. In this game, all commanders have a quality of three, but as the Austrians outnumber the French, they get a plus one bonus. Both players spin a d6 each. No weather changes occur based on the result of both die rolls, whether it can improve or can deteriorate. And the Austrians will win the initiative in this example game. They choose to move first to ensure the French don't move forward and spoil their attack. Now, normally it would be advisable for the Austrians to move second because uh, assuming the French are in a defensive position um, and it's a good defensive position, uh, they'll have no particular inclination to adv advance forward. But you never know, uh, you may actually do so, which could upset the Austrians, which is why the Austrians move first. The reason why the Austrians would probably prefer to move second is if initiative die roll should change, the Austrians end up with a double game turn, which is a big advantage. In this case, the French will end up with a double game turn if player order changes. But anyway, it's one of the things the Austrians have decided to compromise on. They're moving first. Off the player area, the Austrians activate each core one at a time. Each core command activates a core size combat unit, which varies in size from 10 to 14 elements, and costs between 2 to 3 command points each to activate, depending on this size. Now, the commanders, or sub-commanders, all have a quality of 3, which means they all have 3 command points, which means they can actually activate everything that they so desire. The Austrians are aiming for a rapid attack, which is the best strategy in this case because they need to try and beat the reinforcements. Looking at the move in more detail, if we look at the core on the left, which consists of 11 elements, three of which are light foot artillery, infantry can move 8 centimetres in an action, and in all cases, all elements can conduct two actions in this particular case. Limbered foot artillery can also move 8 centimetres, so it can keep up with the infantry, so it will remain in contact with the core, and the cavalry can move 15 centimetres to 18 centimetres per action, depending on the type of cavalry, so it can easily keep up. Thus, the combat unit, the core size combat unit, will remain in base-to-base -base contact with each other as it moves forward 8 centimetres per action. The Austrians have ensured that they do not end their move in the opportunity fire range of the French artillery. If they moved one millimetre forward, they could be subject to opportunity fire. However, the uh, effect is probably quite... Well, actually, they, they can't be subject to opportunity fire because the um, artillery would need to conduct opportunity, opportunity fire through an element to its front. Uh, this can normally occur in fire combat, but for opportunity fire, it can't because the guys in front probably um, are blocking line of sight at that time and uh, they probably don't have time to get out of the way so it doesn't occur. But nonetheless, normally you would advance to just outside of opportunity fire range of anything that happens to be in the enemy front line. Unless, of course, you want to have lots of fire combat being sent against you. We'll now go to the French fire movement phase on game turn one. During the French fire movement phase, the French conduct fire combat against the Austrian line infantry on the left flank which in this image is in the center, expanding two actions and conducting fire combat twice, achieving one hit in each case. The Austrian save roll result is no effect. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. The French light artillery is firing at a range just outside of six centimeters, so it's long range. Its FE is four, that's fire effectiveness. The target is a infantry dot four, which means it's four figures per base, which means it uses four D6. But because it's long range, this is halved to two d6 dice. There are no modifiers. A result of four or greater results in a hit. The Austrian save roll needs a result of two or greater to have no effect if there was one hit, which is what occurred. And 
they achieve this save for both of the fire combats. The French commander needed to activate the artillery in order to do this, which costs one command point. Now, no problems in this particular example game, but if you're using the optional rules, the French player may well choose to save that command point to provide a defense bonuses during the next game turn. But as the, the optional rule for this is not being used, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the rules do contain a whole bunch of additional optional rules. It's probably suggested initially not to use any of them, and only to use the optional rules when you become a bit more experienced. It should be noted the artillery can fire through any friendly element part of the same combat unit. In this case, the whole corps, as it's assumed all troop types are working together and troops will adjust their position to allow for this to occur. If the artillery was not part of the same combat unit, it could not fire through the line infantry because the line infantry would likely not know to get out of the way. This is also the case for opportunity fire. Opportunity fire, by its very nature, occurs on an ad hoc basis, so there is no chance for the guys in front to get out of the way for the artillery to fire, which is why the artillery did not conduct opportunity fire last game turn if the Austrians had moved close enough for it to occur. It is now game turn two, and the player order remains the same. This means the French would have won the initiative, or alternatively the die rolls were a draw. And the reason for this is the Austrians would absolutely love it for the French to move first, which means that at a later time, if the order flipped, the Austrians would get a double move. As it is here, the French having uh, the first move during this phase doesn't give it much of an advantage. The Austrian position is quite strong. The French aren't going to attack anything. Um, but anyway, it's not to be. The Austrians are the first player player or player during the uh, game turn. Now the Austrians now need to activate a core or a commander within a core. That commander then expends command points to activate a combat unit and then it will use additional command points to convert that into an attacking combat unit or activate an attacking combat unit. On the left of the screen the core consists of 10 elements so it costs two command points to activate. The commander has three command points, so if he wants to activate initially to move, no problems, but to activate as an attacking combat unit, that is in order to close to close combat, he needs an additional command point. So the commander in chief gives him one, which reduces the commander in chief's total of command points. The next core does the same, but must leave an element behind due to lack of command points. The next has only enough command points to activate an attacking combat unit of six elements. The final core leaves an element behind and uses the remaining command points from the commander to launch an attack with ten elements. Before any close combat can occur, opportunity firing will occur. An element not being contacted by close combat can conduct opportunity fire using normal opportunity fire triggers. Elements cannot fire through friendly elements when conducting opportunity fire, as the guys in front will not have time to get out of the way. Let's look at this in more detail. The key part of the rules are the definition of combat units. Basically, uh, any element of the same core, which are in base to base together, can, in theory, be a single combat unit. The same with attacking combat unit. All elements of the same core, which are in base to base together, can be an attacking combat unit. So that definition is quite easy. In this case, everything that you see here that's Austrians in contact with the French are a single combat unit, both attacking and also for movement. The attacking, now we need to define the defending combat unit, which uses a different method of definition. Basically, the attacking unit must attempt to attack every element that it's in base to base contact with. With. But it only has four elements in base to base contact and it's in contact with five French elements. So, as a result, there is a bit of choice here. In this particular case, you know, there isn't really a big choice. Um, three of the elements must combat the a French element, the only French element that makes sense to its front. It's only the element on the right which has a choice. It chooses to, you know, quite logically attack the French element slightly to the left of its position based on the way you're looking at this screen. Now, every element that's uh, being attacked is automatically part of the defending combat unit. That's easy. Every friendly element directly behind one of these elements is also part of the defending unit. 
Every other element, even if it's not being attacked, can act as support, and it also becomes part of the defending combat unit. And of course, any element behind it becomes a part of the defending combat unit. We have now defined the French defending combat unit. Incidentally, uh, the elements do not need to be in face-to-face -face con contact with each other, um, unlike a normal combat unit. Anyway, we've got our French force that we're attacking, and we've now got our Austro-Hungarian force that's attacking it. There are four separate close combats, and three elements, or French elements, will act as support. First, the French light infantry, not attacked on the extreme right, can conduct normal opportunity fire. Now, whenever a enemy element stops its movement within the opportunity fire range, which is the effective range of a element, it can be attacked using opportunity fire. When an element contacts another element in close combat, that's defined as stopping. It's in contact, it's within close range of that element, thus normal opportunity fire can occur. The French light infantry has a fire effectiveness of 3 against infantry 4, which results in 3 d6 dice. This is halved to 2 d6. Opportunity fire is always halved in this particular case. One hit is achieved, but the save result in the results in no effect. Now we conduct opportunity fire by the elements being contacted. When you are being contacted, you have one advantage, which means you fire at full effect, there's no halving, and one disadvantage, you must fire against the attacker, and you can only fire against the attacker, and no other element. Normally, opportunity fire can be conducted against two separate elements. Um, in this particular case, that's not possible. The elements which are being engaged by the Austro-Hungarians must use their entire opportunity fire capacity against that single element, well, because obviously it represents the greatest threat to them, and that's where people's eyes and minds are going to be focused. The, the, um, the opportunity fire is um, much the same. It's an FE of three. Um, there's no halving effect. Um, generally, one hit will be achieved probably on average, one to two. And generally, the Austrians will be able to spin, save, and get out of it. Incidentally, the Dragoons have no firepower while mounted. So as a result, they can't conduct opportunity fire. Anyway, the result of all this is opportunity fire is conducted and there is no effect. Just a quick note, if um, a uh, hit had been converted into a disorder, that would have been a fairly serious impact against the Austrians. But anyway, that's not going to occur in this example. Now let's look at each close combat, of which there are four. These are executed in any order the attacking player wishes. As you'll discover later, the order may be significant. Starting with the left of the screen, the Austrians have a light infantry supported by two cavalry against a cavalry, a dragoon, supported by a light cavalry. Each element determines how many die they add to the close combat. There's only a single close combat, which represents a multitude of d6 dice. The Austrian Light Infantry has a fire effectiveness of 3 against a Cavalry 3, resulting in 3 dice. The Hussars have an FE of 4 in the first round. Cavalry have an advantage in the first round, which they lose in all subsequent rounds. This results in 4d6, which is halved to 2d6. When you're supporting, you only you halve all your dice. The Lancers have an FE of 4 in the first round, resulting in 2d6. Obviously, um, it's four halved. Incidentally, the lancers, if they were against infantry, would have a special advantage in the first round, but that's not the case here. The Austrians have a total of seven d6 dice, which result in three hits. The French spin a four on their save, which results in no effect. Remember, three hits means that if the French had spun a one, two, or three, it would mean all their forces are disordered, which is a bad result. They've avoided that. The French dragoons... Uh, against the infantry, or light infantry, have an FE of 5 in the first round, resulting in 5d6. The light cavalry have an FE of 4, resulting in 4 halved to 2d6. The French have 7d6, which also results in 3 hits. The Austrians spin a 3, resulting in disorder. This is not a good start. All, all Austrian elements are now disordered. The Austrians should have, left the attack, should have led the attack with cavalry rather than light infantry. The Austrians will retreat because if they do not retreat during the second round, even though 
all the combat capacities of everyone is greatly reduced. If the Austrians get a second disorder, they become disrupted and they disappear, um, possibly to come back later after a rally, but it's not what the Austrians want to occur. So the French wins the first close combat. A quick note about the retreat move. The Austrians will now retreat, they re which is basically in a direction reverse of the facing of the element, which must be at least six centimetres, unless the element's movement allowance is less than six centimetres, in which case it's the movement allowance. And it can be up to the element's, the element's full movement allowance. If other elements are encountered, they may be passed through freely, as normal, or can choose to be carried away and becoming disordered as a result. Now, first point, uh, yes, you can retreat further than six centimetres, but the Austrians don't really want to do that because they want to come back next round once they've recovered. So they want to retreat the, um, the smallest distance possible, which will be six. The second thing is that uh, if there were artillery with this group, and some artillery have a movement allowance when they're unlimbered of four centimetres, which means they can be left behind. This is one of the risks of having artillery in your um, attacking force mix if they're going to lose. Anyway, something that you need to consider. The final is, of course, if you encounter other elements. Um, now, if you can't retreat, which means that if you retreat and you're in the same spot as another element, that's bad. It means basically you surrender or are eliminated. So you want to avoid that at all costs. So as a result, if you retreat and you discover that um, there are other friendly units behind you which stop you from stopping in the position you need to stop, uh, then uh, it's better if those other elements get carried away. Now in this particular case, the infantry can move back six, which brings it into contact with the commander, so no problems, and the cavalry of course can retreat further. However, you probably uh, would not want to split the light infantry from the cavalry, uh, because the commander doesn't actually add any support um, to it, and if the Austrians attack it, that infantry will be left with effectively less support. So um, the Austrians have decided it's best if they carry the commander away. The only negative is, of course, anything get, that gets carried away is disordered, but as a commander can pretty much automatically recover each game turn. That's not a big issue. Um, it only slightly affects their movement. It's the direction the Austrians have decided to take. In the second close combat, the Austrians have, or the Austrian light infantry, have an FE3 uh, from the light infantry, resulting in 3d6. The Hussars have a FE of 4 in the first round, resulting in 4, half to 2. The, us, the other Hussar is the same. The Austrians have a total of 7d6, spinning 4 hits. The French save results in a disorder. The French Light Infantry have an FE of 3, resulting in 3d6. They achieve one hit. The save roll results in no effect. This is not good for the French, but it's probably expected. The French will retreat 6 centimetres. There's no point sticking around. And that allows the Austrians to occupy the empty spot. No, the Austrians were attacking, so they can advance after combat. If they so desire, they're not required to, but if they desire, they can advance after combat and occupy the spot vacated. Now you'll notice before, when the Austrians attacked the French cavalry and they lost, the French couldn't, did not advance after combat. If you're defending, you do not have the option of advancing after combat. Let's now go to the third close combat. The Austrian light infantry get, once again, three dice. The medium artillery has an FE of six, resulting in five D6, half to three. The Austrians, as a result, have six D6 dice. They achieve three hits, and the French spin a two, resulting in another disorder. The French light infantry have an FE of three, resulting in three D6 dice. They achieve one hit. The save roll results in no effect. Uh, and once again, not good for the French, but is entirely expected. The French will retreat six centimeters because they do not wish to be disrupted. Now, you'll notice in this particular case, um, they could take the corps commander with them, which they will, or they could simply move through the core commander and end up next to the other disordered element. Um, there is a choice in this particular case. In this particular case, they will choose to take the core commander. There's no point having the core commander sticking out uh, in front of the front line. Now we come to the last close combat, which is the fourth on the right. The Austrian light infantry gets 3d6. The medium artillery has a fire effectiveness of six, resulting in 5d6 dice. 
which is halved to three because it's providing support. The Austrians have six d6 dice. They achieve three hits and the French spin a two, resulting in a disorder. So the French are now disordered. The French light infantry have a fire effectiveness of three, resulting in three d6 dice. The supporting light infantry gets two d6 dice and the Dragoons gives the French three more d6. The French spin 8 d6, achieving 4 hits. The Austrians' safe throw is 4, so they become disordered. Both sides are now disordered. Now, in a normal circumstance, the French would pro almost certainly withdraw. However, we're going to go to a second round so you can see what happens. Both sides are disordered. Now, when you're disordered, all your dies, numbers of dies, are halved again. The Austri Austrians get 3 d6, because previously they got 6. Uh, which is, and spin one hit, the French save result in no effect. So the French are okay. If the French spun a one, all three elements would disappear. The French Dragoons uh, drop to an FE of three. Now the reason why we're recalculating is because it's the second round and the French Dragoons do not get their first round fire effectiveness. They get the second round fire effectiveness, or close assault effectiveness, I should really say. So it drops to three, so it halves to two, um, because it's support, and then it's because it's supported halves to one. The French have four d6 dice, spin one hit, save results in no effect. This basically is repeated until one side gets a second disorder and disappears, or both sides get a disorder and both disappear. The French decide to retreat as they would have almost certainly after the first round. You may think all close combats have been completed, however there is still a spot now where two opposing elements are in close combat with, or base-to-base -base contact, which means that we need to have a fifth close combat. This is called the follow-on close combat. Now in this particular case, the Austrians infantry is contacting the French Dragoons on its flank. When you engage in close combat on flank, the number of dice used is halved. The two cavalry behind the Austrians can provide support. The French Dragoon will be attacking the Austrian and the light cavalry to its rear provides support. So let's look at the number of dice. The Austrians get 5 d6 dice, halved to 3. This is for the infantry against the Dragoons. The Hussars behind, which are providing support, is halved twice to give you 2 dice and so is the Hussar behind that. So the Austrians get a total of seven d6 dice. The Austrians spin, achieve three hits, the French spin a two, so the French are disordered. The French Dragoons get five d6 after three. Now this is the first close combat, so the Dragoons do get their first round bonus. So they have three. The supporting cavalry gets an FE of four, which is their first round. Um, with a plus one for lance, because it's lance versus infantry, resulting in 5d6, half twice to two. The French have a total of 5d6 dice. They spin two hits, and the Austrians spin a one, so are also disordered. Both sides are disordered. While the combat could continue, um, the French will almost certainly withdraw. Now, it's possible both sides may decide to withdraw, and in fact, if I was the Austrians, I would probably also consider withdrawing simultaneously. This is possible, but in this particular case the Austrians bravely decide to continue the round of combat or close combat and the French decide to withdraw. So here we see the French withdrawing, they go back there six centimeters. Now the Austrians could advance after combat. If they did they would be in base to base contact with the remaining French cavalry. Now, if the Austrians were not disordered, they would almost certainly do this. Why not? However, they're disordered, and um, if they engage in close combat with the cavalry and they suffer another disorder, it will be bad. So the Austrians decide to stay exactly where they are. They do not advance up combat. So at the end of all close combat, um, the attacking combat unit has no elements in base-to-base -base contact with any opposing elements and the defending defending unit, combat unit, does not have any elements in contact with Austrian elements. This is the end of this particular round. As you can see, the situation is a mess. During the next game turn, the Austrians could continue the attack with the only undisordered troops they possess. 
This is a valid tactics and could force the French to withdraw again, or if they're really lucky, um, disorder the French a second time and really take out or disrupt quite a few French elements. The Austrian command will need three command points to achieve all this, uh, to activate all his elements so he can recover from disorder and, and possibly reform up in a line. In order to uh, launch a, a, an attack with the remaining undisordered elements, he could actually do all this. However, you'll notice that um, some of the elements are not in base-to-base -base contact in the top left corner, which makes things difficult. So generally, the French will probably not decide to do this because they'll lack command points, and also they probably would not want their elements to be sticking out in the middle with no support. And the French does have a good cavalry on the left flank to come in, so um, I think it would be too much of a risk for the, for the Austrians to continue the attack next game turn. The French next game turn could cause havoc with the cavalry. However, particularly if the Austrians are stupid enough to advance in a, with their disordered units in an However, it's almost certainly this cavalry will remain unactivated because the French desperately need all the command points they have to activate all the elements which are disordered so they can recover. The next game turn will almost certainly probably result in both sides forming up for another combat on game turn three. It's likely the rest of the front line will actually be the same as this, resulting in the Austrians advancing six centimetres, but still up against an intact French army. The Austrians should have focused in one spot and tried to break through rather than a broad front attack. Another option is if the, uh, the French um, had actually changed the move order, so they were second rather than the... Sorry, if the Austrians had changed move order, so they were second rather than first, and they flipped in game turn three, then they could find themselves in a very powerful position. But anyway, that's certainly not an option in this case because that didn't happen in game turn number two. Drilling into a bit of history here, uh, historically a Met spent around two hours or more, or two game turns using these rules, preparing his attack, and then when he did launch it, it was extremely slow, different ways, uncoordinated allowing the French to basically withdraw divisions, put in fresh divisions, etc. The Austrian left flank did quite well, as it had at least what you would consider a core commander. The right flank did a good job as well, but lacked very many forces to achieve anything decisive. If I used a historical command structure, it would have taken me several game turns or hours to launch a slow attack. Having never played that, I do not know if I would have been able to break through by 1400 hours, which I think is six game turns from the beginning of this game, or, f or five, uh, six hours later, uh, using these rules, but I suspect I probably would have just been able to break the French, which would have been approximately historical. But anyway, in this particular case, using this kind of attack, um, game turn three, I'll probably launch another mass wave attack, uh, unless I concentrate in one spot, the result will be the same, that's pushing the French further back. The French receive some reinforcements. Um, eventually I'm going to have to concentrate and really, you know, do a proper attack. Um, and then, even so, I, I suspect it would be quite difficult for me to actually get the French off the playing area at the end of six game turns, using the strategy I've used so far. Look, uh, I must admit these rules in the process of being playtested and may experience a much more fine-tuning, but they are at a reasonably stable, playable state. I also have to admit if I find an existing set of rules which offer something similar, that in terms of scale, this project may also go by the wayside and I'll simply use whatever is available out there in the real world. I only went down this path because I saw a gap in the market. If this gap does not actually exist, it's better to not worry about introducing yet another set of rules, as we have too many of these damn things anyway, and use an existing set of rules. The main reason for this is opponents. I mean, um, if you use an existing set of rules, there is at least a chance there will be some opponents out there which will know those rules. Dengitsi Dhaban, Imma Fihil, Hamad Fung, Sulkampan.